energy is complicated and it's, it's a lot more complicated than a lot of people trying to sell you something, make it out to be. There's a lot of nuances. There are a lot of blind corners. And if you make the wrong decision based on bad information, it can cost you a lot of money. So it pays to have somebody who's an expert to help you navigate this. Welcome back to the Compass Mining Podcast. My name is Jared, and today I get to sit down and talk with Blake and Andy from Pine Brook Energy. And as you can imagine, we're going to talk about all things energy. So let's just dive right in. And Blake, as founder and managing partner, talk to me about Pine Brook Energy. Where are you guys located? What work are you doing? What work are you excited to be doing? Because somehow, I don't know how this happened, but we're already in Q4 of 2024 and 2025 is you know, we're already planning stuff for 2025, even for the podcast. So how are you doing? Thank you for hopping on the pod. And yeah, talk to me a little bit about Pinebrook. Yeah, well, thank you very much for having us, the invitation. We're, we're happy to be here. Um, so Pinebrook Energy Advisors, we're a full service energy management consulting firm. Um, most of our clients are very large industrial end users. So not necessarily with a huge footprint, like one to five facilities, but in every one of those facilities, they use a lot of power and gas. And so we help them. We bring both of us have nearly 20 years of experience in the energy industry. We kind of bring that expertise to help them, uh, you know, apply best practices to how you purchasing energy. What are the things to think about with your rates, how you use it, uh, understand what's driving energy prices and how you could manage those risks and kind of best capture opportunities in the marketplace. Excellent. Uh, Andy, nice to see you as well. Could you, do you want to add on anything to what, to what Blake said about what, you know, Pinebrook is up to? I, I know you guys have different roles within the company, so just give you that opportunity. Sure. So yeah, I joined up with Blake. Blake and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, we, we became very good friends in college and we're colleagues for a little bit off and on um, over 10 years ago. Blake, Went off and did his own thing also in the energy business. I stayed here and I'm in Louisville, Kentucky. Blake's located in New York. I stayed around here in Louisville and, and had my own experience in the industry. Uh, when Blake started Pinebrook, obviously very excited for him. And then he got it to a point where he needed some help. And he, he brought me over as a managing partner at the beginning of this year. Um, I've been helping build out some market intelligence solutions. Uh, we have a, a sub stack called the Energy Buyer's Guide, where we're posting regularly about things that are going on in across the energy world, natural gas, electricity markets. Uh, that's something we've uh, been very excited to build out this year and get off the ground. So very exciting stuff going on over here. And um, you know, the, as far as the, the, the Bitcoin tie-in, Blake mentioned that our customers are typically large industrial with one to five sites. Bitcoin miners fit perfectly into that that type of a profile. So that's why we're interested in this space, obviously, um, and, and why we're excited to be talking to you today, Jared. Sweet. Yeah, I actually visited Louisville back in 2017 for a wedding, and I absolutely loved it. I went to college in Memphis, and I just think those kind of small mid-south cities, Memphis, I know Nashville's now, people don't consider it small. It's still kind of small if you're coming from New York, obviously, Blake. Those cities are amazing, so that's great. And and touching there, if you could, this is for either whoever wants to hop in, could you talk to me a little bit about where your partners are? You know, Where are the facilities that you're supporting if Blake's up in New York and Andy, you're down in Louisville? Are you guys more trying to stay close to the Mississippi to the East Coast, or are you also open to the West Coast? And I ask this because Bitcoin miners listening obviously have facilities all over the country. Yeah, no, our clients are pretty much everywhere, kind of across the United States, uh, sometimes in Canada. Um, but for the most part, they're in deregulated electricity markets, right? So they're in markets where you can go to somebody other than the local utility to buy power. Um, so that lends itself to, you know, kind of most of like the Northeast, some of the Midwest, Texas is a big market for us. So um, really anywhere that you can go out and negotiate a power agreement through a retail provider is kind of the, the, the main focus on the power side. On the gas side, it's really all over. So we've helped clients from coast to coast, north to south, really everywhere. So, and to your point, when you ask about where we were, you know, we pretty much embrace the uh, remote work. So we're effectively remote first and only, and we're going to try to keep it that way. So, you know, as I'm in New York, Andy's in Louisville, we have a, another employee in Nashville. So uh, we're really all over and, you know, happy to have anybody join the team from anywhere with a good internet connection. Amazing. That's the same with Compass. A lot of the people that are outside of our service center and obviously not working on our facilities day in and day out, we have a global team. And maybe this isn't something that people see. So if you're looking at Compass from the outside, know that there's a global network of people that are on 24 hours a day because we're across like, I don't know, 15, 16 time zones. And so that's wonderful. 
good to know that you're all over the country and especially you have a footprint in Texas, about 40% of at least what we know because it's been reported of the public hash rate from the public miners is out of Texas. So obviously energy and Texas are kind of synonymous in many industries. When I think about Pinebrook and I'm looking at the website and I'm trying to dive in deeper, one of the things that is, is sticking out to me. And this is also something that Heather Pierce called out, who I know is our colleague, who I think met you guys down in Houston, is thinking about kind of, I want to say custom solutions or or custom uh, tailored, tailored solutions for people. And that's helping miners, uh, especially to understand maybe their power bills, tariffs, negotiating rates, negotiating PPAs, auditing their bills. Could you talk to us uh, about, when I say us, I mean the, the Bitcoin mining community here at large, who's probably listening, about the, uh, the services that you offer that dovetail so perfectly with the Bitcoin mining industry? Yeah, sure. So just on that point about the rates, you know, utility rates are incredibly complicated and they're not standard. So if you go to one utility and you look at their their rate book or their tariff, it's going to be completely different from another. So just kind of getting in there and, and digging into the rate to understand, you know, a lot of times people get caught up on the headline dollar per kilowatt hour rate. And they say, oh, OK, well, that's a great price. But then you go in and you look and there's a demand charge, there's a customer charge and there's this other charge. And there's all these other things that need to be taken into account. So just helping kind of uh, help come companies model that out to understand what are your actual costs? Um, what's this going to look like over 12 months? What are the levers you can pull to try to reduce some of those costs outside of just using less power? Um, that's a that's a big part of it, kind of in that rate analysis and optimization. Um, but then, you know, and I'll, I'll kick it over to Andy. Like the, one of the bigger points is if you're in one of those markets where you have uh, control, you can buy power ahead of time to lock in certain rates. We try to give as much market intelligence about, look, these are the things that are driving those prices. And here's what we would recommend as far as how much you can lock in. But again, and that's Andy's kind of specialty of like what's going on in the markets and, and how can you control those risks? So I'll, I'll let him speak to more of that. Yeah. So, you know, our typical client wants to reduce volatility in some degree with their energy costs. So we, we help them develop a, a plan that fits their risk profile, helps them meet their goals to, to buy for. And I realize that a lot of times Bitcoin miners don't want to do that, uh, just in the limited experience I have talking with miners, because they don't want to give up that upside, which we, we totally understand, because there's going to be times when the price is extremely low. You don't want to uh, lock anything in that's going to prevent you from participating in that. But at the same time, you know, building a, a long long term stability as a miner, if you've got a product over here where you can lock in a hash price with a derivative, you've got a product over here where you can lock in your energy price. That's you know, you can establish some some certainty with your margin going forward, the way I understand it, at least. So that's when, when I look at, at Bitcoin miners from a risk management standpoint, I look at everything on your every aspect of the operation in some degree is is hedgeable. And when you can do that, it opens up a lot of opportunities to literally lock in a, a profit margin for an extended period of time. And and that's, you know, conversations that we would love to have with miners just to see if it makes sense. And in some cases it might not. I mean, right now in Texas, for instance, we look at the forward power price. It's relatively high. It's down a little bit from where it was over the summer, but still it, it, it probably doesn't make sense to buy long term in Texas right now. But that's a conversation that that we can have. And we're monitoring these markets basically so a, a miner, one of our other clients doesn't have to and helping them understand what's driving prices and what, frankly, we expect to happen with prices going forward. Yeah, we're going to dive into maybe a little bit later at the end of the uh, episode, the energy buyer's guide. And we can talk a little bit more about forecasting future prices, because I think your newsletter and the sub it's not a newsletter, excuse me, it's a blog or a sub stack. I, I think it's awesome. And I was reading through yeah, it and I'll be sure. honest, I understood maybe 70% of it just because there's some jargon in there. So maybe we could talk about that. But I actually would love to dive into some of the stuff that you guys have just said and, and ask you a question as, as, as two guys who met in college. Very cool. You guys have been around energy for a long time. When was the first time you heard about Bitcoin mining as something that would work in in harmony with the energy sector and i say that because the way bitcoin mining is today was not the way it was eight years ago in 2016 2015 it's just there wasn't this mass these mass facilities of 200 megawatts being you know put up overnight not obviously overnight i'm using i'm being a little hyperbolic here right but like this didn't exist where it is today so when was the first time you guys it kind of came across your desk it's like hey maybe this is an opportunity for energy 
Yeah, I mean, just my own Bitcoin experience. I came across Bitcoin in probably like 2013, 2014. I did a lot of research, but unfortunately didn't buy any, or maybe I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'd be resting on a beach somewhere with a drink in my hand. But uh, it was really probably closer to like 2017, 2018 that the, the energy intensity started to become a, a conversation. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about Bitcoin mines is that they have this unique, you know, this unique characteristic that you don't see with a lot of other industrials is they're, they're super flexible loads. So the fact that you can respond pretty close to immediately, either to price signals or in advance of when you expect, you know, uh, peak loads on, on certain power systems to occur gives you this huge range of opportunities to capture some of these market opportunities we're talking about, right? In some cases, to actually make money, right? Now, this is, a, again, this is to Andy's point, you're, you're really, you're adding risk here rather than managing it. But if you if you make a forward power purchase and then, you know, you don't use that power, you're going to sell it back at the prevailing market rate. So in some cases, that could be at a profit. So if you could find yourself in a situation where you can respond that quickly and sell back any forward purchase power at a profit, you know, yeah, you're not mining Bitcoin, but you're selling your power profitably. It, again, it, it just adds another uh, interesting dynamic to the whole thing. So, yeah, I would say, you know, it's been more and more of a conversation since 2017, 2018. And I know now, now that there's especially like this arms race for power, now that the, you know, uh, AI data centers are starting to become the main talking point of like, where is this power going to come from? You know, I think it's, uh, it's becoming even more important to start thinking creatively about, you know, maybe just connecting to the grid isn't the answer anymore. Yeah. And, and for me, probably more recently, I mean, I've obviously known about Bitcoin from an, an arm's length for, for quite some time, but it wasn't until I, I went to the, the conference in Houston earlier this year where I just, I saw the sheer scale of it. And what struck me the most was just the absolute ingenuity of the market that not only we're talking about how to minimize on the grid, but how quickly the markets move to off the grid and trying to get literally as close as possible to the source of energy, to the point of constructing generation units out in the natural gas field, trying to capture flared gas to generate power and, and mine Bitcoin remotely. I mean, it, it, I was just so taken aback and impressed by the like I said before, the ingenuity of how, how we're going to get energy as close to the source as we possibly can. And that's when it really hit home exactly how intensive energy was in this entire process. And how without energy, I mean, it, it, the, the industry doesn't exist. So clearly this is a relationship that's going to be in place going forward. And uh, obviously it's going to continue to evolve as well. Yeah, it's going to continue to evolve. And I love what you're talking about of putting generation out and getting some of the flare off. I just had on a guest, Alana Media Via Diaz. She's uh, Puerto Rican and she created probably the best documentary, if not maybe one of the only, but definitely the best about Bitcoin mining. And one of the villages, she well, she, one of the communities she highlights is a village that's in Malawi. And it you like it's one of those villages where you have to like walk to, right? Like there's not like defined roads. Maybe you can get there on like a motorcycle or whatever. And but they have enough rivers that go through where they were able to get power off that and start mining Bitcoin. But it's absolutely insane that that even exists. And that's allowed them to basically bring power to that community, uh, bring reasonable power and an investment to the community, because otherwise there wouldn't be a reason to really attach them to the current grid that they have out there because it would never make sense. There's no dollars and cents to attaching this community because it's so far remote. So Bitcoin mining is definitely solving things that I think in the past, there was just a lot of wasted energy. Uh, and I'm fairly new to the energy conversation that does exist around Bitcoin mining. But from what I understand, we're wasting a lot because even one or 2% daily from a global standpoint is massive and massive and massive amounts of energy. It may not seem like much like, yeah, 98 cents, two cents to a dollar, but like it's a lot, right? So I asked you about when you both kind of heard about Bitcoin uh, or, or Bitcoin mining from an energy standpoint. And now I would love to ask um, Andy, can you talk to me about how some of the regulation maybe around getting energy to the future of, I want to say electrifying energy, and that just sounds super cheesy, but it's like, Blake, you've just touched upon it. We have AI, we have Bitcoin mining and just high powered compute. Are you guys seeing, or Andy, are you seeing regulation that is maybe local or, or national here that is starting to provide incentives for energy to go in that direction? Uh, and I say that because you said the word, Blake, and it's obviously on my list of things to talk about. The energy arms race is on. 
Um, so what are you guys seeing? And Andy, I want to throw that to you. From a regulation standpoint, uh, I think Blake might might have some better ideas there. But from just a, a pure market standpoint, pretty much everybody right now in the energy industry, Bitcoin, AI, everybody's expecting electricity demand to go up and potentially go up dramatically. And we're, we're starting to see the beginnings of some consequences around that. Um, without getting too deep into the weeds, PJM, which is the largest power market in the country, they saw one component of, of their power cost capacity absolutely blow up for the, the year that starts um, for 2025, 26. Um, it went up ninefold um, compared to where it was in this most recent year. And that is, you know, a, a function of the market doesn't isn't sure that there's enough generation to meet demand or it's getting the, that, that gap is getting tighter. So that, that premium to be paid for new capacity on the market is going up. And we think that that might just be the beginning of, of these types of trends going forward where you're retiring a lot of coal units. That's been going on for a decade. We're starting to see some natural gas units retired in certain markets. So you're trading in kind of old school, reliable fossil fuel generation for wind and solar and batteries and, and other newer generation types that might not be able to meet around the clock demand as well as as the legacy fossil fuel units. So as demand grows and as the new generation is more intermittent, at, at least for now, that poses a lot of challenges to the, the power grid. And we see volatility potentially going up going forward and we see risk uh, going up as well. And that's not even to talk about you know, the natural gas side of things where there's all kinds of other issues where we're exporting more, producers are being a little bit more disciplined. We just see a, a real minefield of risks going forward. And, and a lot of that does come back to these dynamics of growing demand and uncertainty about what's going to be on the supply side of the balance sheet. Blake, do you want to add anything about uh, regulation there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I the biggest news kind of in the generation space was the Inflation Reduction Act, which was really not meant to target inflation, but to develop more green energy, right? And so I think that there's there was more, more and more push to try to continue to build out the renewable resources. But I think that what has happened since that uh, legislation was passed and today is that there's a realization that we actually might need a lot more than, than was kind of penciled in, right? To Andy's point, when you look back at the data, there was this idea when we first got in the industry in like the, like the early 2000s-ish, like 2007, 2008, that um, electricity demand was just going to continue to grow in this linear trend ad infinitum. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And then you had, you know, really 15 years of just flat load growth. Like there was not any load growth. And I think it led to a lot of people getting very complacent about the need for new generation. And to Andy's point, obviously from a, from a, a, a environmental perspective, it makes sense to, to retire these coal units. Not only, they were also very old, right? So you got these older, dirtier units that were coming offline and nobody was in too much of a rush to replace them. There was a little bit of a push for some natural gas. But what we saw on the horizon was this, to Andy's point, this this kind of, we were, we were about to come up against a wall where you may not have enough generation to meet current demand. And then just in the past, you know, however many, however been it's long since, uh, uh, um, you know, chat GPT shook the world, all of a sudden it's like, actually, we're getting a lot more demand, a lot more uh, power than we even thought originally. So that was a big part of why we, we decided to start the business is that, you know, we, we saw uh, a lot of change coming and we thought it was going to lead to a lot of volatility. And more importantly, we were just going to be living in this new energy world that was not like the one we came from. And I think it's going to create a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities. But, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of companies who need some help navigating that. Um, so so that's, you know, but yeah, to your point about the regulation, you know, I think one of the bigger stories in the past, I mean, a huge story that happened just in the past couple of weeks was this idea that Microsoft signed the deal with Constellation Energy to bring Three Mile Island back online, right? So we're now talking about, okay, well, we may not be able to build new nuclear, but we're gonna we're gonna re recharge the ones we've already taken offline. So you, and more importantly, you're seeing that the the tech companies are taking the lead. They're not waiting for either grid operators or local utilities to to put this generation in place. They're taking matters in their own hands. And they, if that means you know signing these these tw this 20 year PPA to take power directly off a nuclear unit, they'll do it. It's crazy you bring up ChatGPT because that is something now that I use pretty frequently 
not just for work, honestly, more outside of work. If I'm just curious about something, it can just synthesize any data I want. Like I don't need to have a PhD in ancient Greek history. I can just be like, hey, ChatGPT, what was happening in this war? Can you explain it to me like I was five? And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. ChatGPT launched on November 30th, 2022. It's a date that lives in my head rent-free because we haven't even come up to its two-year anniversary. Uh, and I have a two-year-old nephew and he can't talk. And so I worry what, what ChatGPT is going to be in 10 years from its ability to do things, which is going to be cool. I think it's going to continue to move us forward. But on the energy side, I'm like, oh my gosh, this thing's a two-year-old and it's already changing the energy landscape. And yeah, Meta came out the other day and they're doing that with uh, the, what's the name? It's the Three, three Mile Island. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Microsoft signed the deal with Three Mile Microsoft, Island. Microsoft, excuse me, uh, yeah, not Meta. Yeah, and it's owned by, uh, the, the, the parent company is Constellation Energy, and they but they own the, the plants. So that's who the deal was with, yeah. For some reason in my head, I, I heard Meta, even though you did say Microsoft, and Microsoft obviously owns um, ChatGPT or, excuse me, OpenAI. I wanted to get into the challenges and the opportunities, and you kind of led me there. For me, the challenges I see moving forward are potentially political ones. It seems like different candidates, whether it's a Harris Trump, whether it's a Republican, whether it's a Democrat, it seems like different sides of the aisle are seeing things differently. So I don't want to dive into politics here, but I do want to talk about the impacts of politics if we could. The other one that I see from 30,000 feet is climate. We spoke a little bit before this, but seeing the images of Asheville, Tennessee underwater was weird. I looked at Asheville for college and I loved it. It was this nice little mountain area in the middle of the Appalachian Trail. At that point, this is 20 years ago. It wasn't it wasn't where it is today as far as the tourism it gets and sure. the, the kind of the fervor. So I think politics, I think climate, and then I think the corporate corporate demand uh exactly what you're saying we're not going to wait for there to be uh for the government or the state or the local the regional to put in something we're just you know the money is there now for corporates to just be like yep i'm gonna buy that that's mine now i'm gonna get that back online it's gonna be for me so and if that happens it's like okay how do we how does the rest of the world grow in that climate where they just can't compete there's just not the dollars it's why the private industry has always moved a little bit faster than the public industry so i don't know who wants to take one i've just thrown out three different balls there up in the air for you guys to think about um maybe we could start with the uh, in the in politics and i don't know who wants to take that but maybe you could talk about that is that something you're worried about from like a hey andy or hey blake uh, is November 5th going to be, you know, worse off than November 4th, regardless of who wins because of X, Y, and Z? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to navigate that minefield. Um, <laughs> I, I would say <laughs> probably not. I, I, I think that it gets over, a lot of it gets a little overblown on the campaign trail. And one of the big hot button topics is fracking. Um, at this point, that cat's out of the bag. I don't think that there's any politician that's going to come along in the foreseeable future ever that's going to do a federal ban on hydraulic fracturing and suddenly the price of natural gas skyrockets. It's been left up to the states to this point, and it's worked out really well for some states that have allowed it. Others have chosen not to. And, and you know, there, there's uh, benefits there as well. But one thing that we do watch very closely is some of the stuff from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, with regards to pipeline build out. And that's something that we have seen seen stall. So from a, an energy cost standpoint, if you look at the price of energy, say in the middle of Pennsylvania versus the price of energy or natural gas, especially in the Northeast, geographically, we're not talking about two different, vastly different regions of the country. They're not super far apart, but the ability to actually move the those molecules of gas from the production hub into the demand centers is constrained. And Right now, the landscape in a lot of those areas politically is not friendly at all to developing new uh, transportation and pipeline capacity for natural gas. Uh, We see something similar in the Southwest where you've got all this extremely cheap, even free natural gas sometimes in the, the Permian Basin in West Texas. And then meanwhile, in Southern California, we don't have enough pipeline capacity to move the gas over there where it's needed a lot during the year. And you can see the, the price absolutely blow up there. So we, we're seeing the, the, the markets become a lot more regionalized. And, and you're seeing a lot of the, these risks go from a national level to a very local level. And a lot of that comes down to we don't have the ability to move the gas from where it's being produced to the places that need it. And the process of building a pipeline is becoming incredibly difficult for a lot of reasons, many of which are political and environmental. Now, Blake, do you have anything to add to that? 
Um, well, look, I just 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 to, to uh, throw a little background there. Andy's mentioning natural gas in 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 relation to the power because for right sure. now, about fifty percent of the electricity generated in the United States comes from natural gas. So when you think about natural gas and electricity, those those two commodities are intertwined especially from a pricing perspective. I mean, that's the reason nobody has a Bitcoin mine in Boston in the wintertime is because that has some of the most expensive power in the country, right? So um, that would be the first thing I say. But, you know, I would say that not just gas, but on the power side, right? There's, a, there's becoming a, a, a growing recognition that power transmission is also difficult to build. And that's just kind of a function of the United States, right? We have these like patchwork um, kind of overlapping regulatory agencies and state agencies and all these different people, all these different stakeholders who have to buy in. And, you know, when you look to other countries, and by no means is this a, a promotion of the Chinese model, but, you know, in China, they say, <laughs> we're going to build a transmission line from here to here. It gets built. But in the United States, you've got to get, you know, 17 people on board and all these different people have to have to check the box and say, this is okay. So it's become really difficult in the U.S. to build energy transmission, transportation infrastructure. There seems to be a growing acceptance that that is a problem and that's gonna hinder future uh, renewable build out. And so I think that you're starting to at least see some kind of push to not only on the gas pipe side, but also on the power transmission line side, you're starting to see a little bit more um, push to, to, to lower the hurdles there, right? To make it a little, a little, uh, a little less friction in getting this stuff permitted and built. So, I mean, that, that's good. That, that's, that would be positive because, you know, you mentioned earlier too, um, or maybe Andy did, you know, in Southern California, there's so much solar that in the middle of the day, the price of power can be negative. So, you know, honestly, if you want to put a, a, a Bitcoin mine somewhere, I mean, you might want to look at Southern California in the, in the, su in the middle of the summer. Actually, it's, it's a little bit worse in the spring, I think, when there's less power demand. But if you just want to run it in the, in the spring and the fall in Los Angeles, you're going to occasionally get hours where the price is negative and you're going to get paid to take that power off the grid. So, you know, that that's an issue when you when you have all this really concentrated renewable production in West Texas and Southern California, a lot of wind in the Midwest, and it can't get to where people need it. You're going to have these wide disparities in pricing. And that's just a function of transportation. Thank you for breaking that down. I'm, as I say, pretty novice when it comes to energy. And so it's good to hear that one of the biggest challenges is just an age old challenge of location, 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 right? That's the number one thing in real estate. They say, if you yeah. can't, you know, and as we talked earlier, that's the fascinating thing about Bitcoin mining, where you can move the actual use of the gas or of the energy right up next to it. So you're cutting that. It, it could be a meter and <laughs> as opposed to maybe, uh, you know, 2000 miles. That's politics. We've touched a little bit there on the environmental, being that the environmental regulations can be a quagmire, whether they're state, regional, local, or national, to try to get some things done. I think more when I see flooding in places we've never seen flooding before, I'm like, okay, if that's taking out power infrastructure, that's going to be costly to get back online at a point where we're trying to figure out how we can create more. So... Am I am I right in the sense that maybe that's the challenge with climate or what other things are maybe challenging from a climate standpoint or, you know, this extreme weather we're seeing all over in places where we haven't seen it before? How are you guys thinking about that with your clients and the customers you're supporting? Well, we're, we're trying to prep them for higher cost is really what it comes down to, because to your point, like what you're talking about is a hardening of the delivery system. Right. And like and, and or repairing in, in the case. Right. Um, and so we're just, th those costs end up the way that most utility rate structures work, get passed on to the end users, right? Um, so unless you have some kind of massive federal or state funding, which I doubt is going to happen to, to harden these systems, to prevent or repair after these types of, um, you know, terrible tragedies, you know, that money's going to get passed on to the end users. So now, the way you can kind of get around that is you leave the utility system and make the power yourself on site. But that has its own kind of unique challenges and costs that you kind of have to weigh. But that's the other thing, right? Like reliability is a major issue, right? If you have long periods of, of time without power, like you saw in Houston after after that storm or like you're seeing in North Carolina, right? If you want business continuity, you know, you, you may need to think about being able to make your own uh, power on site there. Yeah, and the, the other thing we're you know sitting here in late September, um, so hurricane season and all this stuff is fresh on our mind. But when you look at some of the winter weather events that we've seen over the past five years, that's had a pretty dramatic impact, not only on some of the 
you know, the, the infrastructure, we, we've seen it get freezing cold in places where, frankly, you know, the power generation infrastructure wasn't designed to operate under those conditions in Texas. Uh, production of natural gas was not designed to continue flowing under those conditions. And uh, I'm speaking specifically about uh, winter storm Uri in February of 2021. We saw prices get to a point in some of these areas that, frankly, nobody thought possible. And that has had a, a lasting impact on the forward price of, of power and the forward price of natural gas. If you used to look at a, an ERCOT forward price curve, ERCOT is the, the power market in Texas, and you had this big premium in the summer because that's when we thought that all the risk was. The winter was was down here really low. Um, after URI, now you have kind of a, it's still the highest in the summer, but you have that secondary peak in the forward curve because market participants realize, hey, this is not an area without risk. So the the these weather events not only are changing, um, I guess, promoting issues and problems with, with infrastructure, but they're also changing the dynamics of a lot of these marketplaces with regards to where where is the risk set and when does the risk set during the year. And, and we have seen um, a lot of these forward pricing structures change seeming, seemingly permanently. You mentioned uh, prices as they you know, relate and pertain to weather in the energy buy, buyer guides. One of the most recent articles saying it's looks like it's going to be a warmer than normal October, which obviously will then affect pricing before we call that out and make sure we give that shout out. We've kind of outlined some challenges here. Uh, we have the last one that I really like to talk about, which I think you guys have both hit on now, which is like, well, if you're having these issues, you could just get a generator, obviously not a generator. That's what a residence would use, but the generator being get, find a way to secure your own power. And that's that corporate demand. That's another challenge that I think we're going to see. Do you guys want to touch a little bit about that challenge? And then you could even start to let's roll into the opportunities and flip the coin and talk about how, you know, Pinebrook energy is here to support customers to turn these challenges into opportunities. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the biggest challenge if you're uh, an end user looking to maybe put some power generation on site is is the capital expense, right? Those things are not inexpensive. Um, and then you do begin to run into some other issues with sizing in some cases and some environmental concerns about your emissions. So it's not as simple as like, well, I'm just going to go buy a power generator and I'll make my own power. So there's a lot more to kind of walk through and to consider. Um, but, you know, we help clients evaluate this all the time. So, you know, a lot of proposals have some uh, what we'll call fuzzy math is probably being generous, right? And so helping them understand exactly like what the what the cost outlay looks like, what the revenue potential looks like, or the cost savings in some cases look like, you know, that's kind of where we really help dig in. For example, we have a client now who's evaluating some solar plus battery. Um, and again, we, we have some questions about some of the math, don't necessarily think it won't add up, but you know, we're, we're, we're digging into it for them to make sure that, look, this is exactly how this is gonna work. This is how these markets work. This is a realistic estimate on how much money you're going to save. That's where we we really dive in on that side of the the equation. Andy, I feel like you got maybe something to add there. No, and and you know to Blake's point, it, it's not cheap to add significant on-site generation. So you, you consider obviously the return, like you're avoiding buying power off the grid, whether that's your entire load or a significant portion of it. But then I think what you were kind of getting at is the, the security aspect of that, just to have on-site generation. If something does go haywire and there's a, a widespread power outage, are you able to still keep the lights on at your specific facility? And a lot of that comes down to you know reliability of, of whatever your input fuel is. If it's a combined cycle, natural gas turbine, you want to make sure that you've got reliable nat gas coming in. If it's a, a diesel generation, generator, make sure you have that on site. Uh, we, we tend to kind of look at it through the, through the, the lens of on-site solar because that's really popular right now. But no matter what type of generation you have on site, look at the economic side. Also look at the, that secure security side to make sure that uh, you're going to be able to have that thing spinning when you need it. Absolutely. I think I think people having their own generation is going to, uh, for bigger companies, especially some of the bigger Bitcoin miners and obviously AI companies and the fact that Microsoft is making that play is a massive signal to the rest of the kind of uh, power hungry, uh, power seeking uh, industries that are out there. Bitcoin mining is one of them. Just as a, you know, two minute elevator pitch, you're back in Houston 
and you each get stuck in the elevator with a Bitcoin miner. And this is your moment because honestly, everyone's looking for great energy solutions and Pine Brook's going to bring them that. Andy, I'm going to throw you this, as you called it earlier, a minefield. I'll throw it to you first. Uh, you know, what's your, what's your, what's your pitch to this person who's running a, a big Bitcoin mine, or they maybe got 500 miners in a shed somewhere and they've got some land and, they, and, and they've and they got some cheap energy, but they're not sure about maybe the PPA. Take whatever example you want, but I would love to hear your your kind of pitch for the for the, for the Bitcoin mining community. Yeah, I mean, my, my pitch would be energy is obviously the, the most important input cost that you have. And you want somebody that knows what they're doing watching that for you, whether they're watching the dynamic market in a deregulated area or keeping an eye on your utility bills and making sure that, that you're paying the tariff you agreed to in a regulated space. Uh, we, we see prices going up in the future. We see volatility going up. And it's really easy. It was just two years ago in 2022 when the price of natural gas and electricity in the U.S. went absolutely bonkers for about nine months. And we've had a couple of years of relatively tame prices since then. It's very easy to get complacent. Uh, people have very short memories. Clients I've worked with in the past tend to get, they, they forget the, the bad times and just focus on the good. But it's very important not to get too relaxed. You need to stay vigilant about watching developments in the market, whether those are regulatory, whether those are market related specifically. And it, it, it's, it's, Energy is a risk that's very much worth managing. And for a Bitcoin miner where that is such an important aspect of your entire business model, you need to be on top of it. And it definitely, I think, helps to have experts in that business um, helping you with uh, helping you manage that cost. Blake, you're stuck in the elevator. <laughs> yeah, look, energy is complicated and it's, it's a lot more complicated than a lot of people trying to sell you something to make it out to be. There's a lot of nuances. There are a lot of blind corners. And if you make uh, the wrong decision based on bad information, it can cost you a lot of money. So it pays to have somebody who's an expert to help you navigate this. And more importantly, someone who's not trying to sell you anything else, right? We only sell advice. That's it. We're here to give you the best advice for your business to understand how whatever you're buying, be it a on-site generator or even just a, a, a negotiating a power agreement um, that, you know, Understanding your your risks, your rewards, your opportunities, uh, and getting that as unbiased advice. That's what we provide to our clients. Excellent. And now let's touch upon the Energy Buyer's Guide because as someone who creates content for a living now, I love that you guys are using Substack. I think that it's one of the best platforms if you're trying to get out in front of an audience. Talk to me a little bit about that, Andy. I see that you seem to be the author there. How has that been working? And the story in my head is that's providing clients basically passive alpha, right? They can go there anytime and just kind of check in. Um, what else, you know, if someone's listening to this, why else should they maybe go down and click the link in the description to check out the energy buyer's guide? So when, when we kind of had the idea for this, the target customer or the target reader was somebody that worked for a company that is in charge of buying in energy. And these are the folks that Blake and I have worked with for our entire careers. They're, they've got their finger on the pulse a little bit about what's going on in the market, but they've got a million other responsibilities. So following every aspect of what's going on in the gas and power markets is not possible for them. So the idea with this is to take all of this information, all these different voices out in the marketplace, distill them into something that's actionable and something that's interesting to somebody who's got energy as a, a part of their responsibilities at, at their facility. What we found um, since we launched this about five months ago now is that there's a lot of folks that are just kind of interested in, in energy. So we're, we're, we're writing to those people as well. I mean, right now, everything that's up there is, is free. That might not always be the case, but right now it's a, a free mile. So we invite anybody to go check it out. Uh, the Energy Buyer's Guide on Substack. We post uh, almost every day, at least some bit of content. If there's anything late breaking, we'll typically cover that there. And then we have regular features that come out. But, but yeah, anybody who has any sort of an interest in energy, we think that they're going to find value in looking at that and having basically, a, like Blake said, energy is complicated. What we're trying to do with that, and we hope we're doing an effective job, is distilling something that's extremely complicated into something that's very digestible. And somebody with maybe a cursory knowledge of the industry uh, can, can appreciate it and get information from it. 
Yep, I'm that guy. I read it and I missed about 70%, no, I missed about 30% of it only because of the jargon, but I got the basic flow and the basic ideas of what's happening in energy and what could be happening next month and next quarter. So I think it's great. And I just love when companies are creating content to just bring honestly more attention to what they're doing, uh, to all the benefits that they bring as a company. I know, I think Andy, you and I connected on LinkedIn or Blake, maybe you and I connected on LinkedIn, but if people want to reach out to you, where's the best place? Maybe uh, Blake, if you could shout out where people can and get in touch with both you and Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, you know, the best place is to uh, reach out to us at the energy buyer's guide, right? You can, there's a lot of uh, interaction there. You can comment, you can direct message us, I believe. Um, and as Andy said, we're, we're, posting content all the time. That is uh, you, just one quick note. You do have to type in www.energybuyersguide, kind of a weird <laughs> sub stack URL issue there. So don't forget your, your tri dubs. Um, but you can also find us at pinebrookenergy.com or uh, both of us are pretty, pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. So, you know, we, to, we, to your point, like we started to try to maybe do a little bit of Twitter content creation, but we just didn't really feel like that was the best medium for what we were doing. And the, the flexibility within Substack and especially the ability to do written content, to upload PDFs. Uh, and then also we do a lot of like video updates. So, you know, video content or even that you could just listen to via audio, you know, that's all going to be there. Okay, great. I'm going to add in the website, the Energy Buyer Guide. I'll put in both of your LinkedIn's and those will all be in the episode description. So if you're listening to this on a podcast platform or on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe and check out all of those links. Be sure to follow us at Compass Mining on X, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Andy and Blake, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks, Jared. Much appreciated. It was fun. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was great. 